All right. Uh, just before we get started, uh, thank you, Grant, yesterday, even though I didn't see it, for sending me a message letting me know that um, that I had dropped from the call. I'm going to have to keep checking every few minutes, literally coming down here and checking to make sure that this still looks OK. All right. And if for some reason I lose you, well, then I'll do whatever I can to get it back right away. I mean, the weather is still a little bit funky today. I know you probably all know that. But um, yesterday, again, we did. I went and lectured from about 8.05 till 9.05. We took a 10-minute break. Then sometime during that break, it's like the, my I dropped, and I didn't realize that. So I kept going for 40 more minutes, all right? And it didn't tape any of that extra time. So, and that's okay. So what I did um, afterward yesterday is I went back and retaped it so that 40 minutes became 30 minutes, but it's on two different lectures. So if you were wondering why that's on two different uh, YouTube lectures yesterday, that is why. All right, so today we're actually, we are gonna do all this in that we're going to go over Murak chapter 10, but we, we wanna do this today. First, I want us to look at where we are in this class all right and then i want to go over the chapter nine problems that we said yesterday we'd go over then we'll go over chapter 10. i think i'm going to wait and hold off on going over the chapter 10 example until tomorrow all right so tomorrow we will go over the chapter 10 example to start then i'll lecture on chapter 11 then we'll look at one or two of the chapter 11 examples now what that should mean is there were there were somewhere around 11 problems i don't know exactly how many but somewhere around 11 problems in this section i mean we can go back and count them it's not that it's that big a thing one way or the other but if i go back here to the beginning so what between 8 and 11 there are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 8 right here and on the other one Nine, 10, 11, 13, so 14. And by the time tomorrow rolls around, we will have done approximately half of those. All right. Now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be as fair as possible. You're losing a lab day this week, and you're losing the lab day because of the Good Friday observance. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give you next Monday as just a regular lab day to kind of make up for the one that we're going to lose this week. And I will also make sure that by Monday, by Monday, I will also email you the um, pretest for chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. Then I will give you Tuesday to work on that pretest. All right. And Wednesday will go over it. Then Thursday of next week. So at the end of next week, we'll have the test on chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. All right. So let me jump back into here. And of course, I log myself off of Red Shelf. So I'm going to jump back here and tell you that it was very interesting. Um, I don't think I shared this with anybody before, but um, twice a year at Rankin Technical College, we have Information Technology Advisory Committee meetings. What does that mean? That means in fall, we have people who um, work in business and industry and we get together. We've done it both in person and we've done it over Microsoft Teams as well. All right, and the one in last fall was in Microsoft Teams. Then in spring, what we do is we have an IT Al Rankin Alumni Advisory Committee meeting where we have people who have graduated from any of the IT programs within the last three years. And um, what we do is basically Believe it or not, it takes probably a good half hour to for everybody to introduce themselves. 
And Evan runs the meeting. And he does a very good job of this. And then we, he asks three questions. The first question is, what did you take here at Rankin Technical College that you're able to use in your job every day? You could kind of look at that as like, kind of, what are we doing right? All right. Then he has another one where he basically turns it around and says the equivalent of, what are we doing wrong? All right. And then finally, um, he comes in and says, OK, if you were like if you were a ranking instructor, so you'd been out in business working and now you're applying for a job and you've been hired as an instructor from Rankin, what are we not teaching that you'd like to see being taught right now? All right. We did that. And then finally, Mr. Corrigan came in and started asking about the gen ed classes. So. This happened last night. It was about an hour and a half long meeting. And I will tell you, there's a very good chance that one or more of you, in fact, all of you, after you graduate, will be invited to participate. It was 6 to 7.30 last night. It was via Microsoft Teams. So I'm going to give you a, literally about a two-minute uh, summary of this. What are we doing right? Well, in the program that you're in right now, all right, it's funny because some people said, Boy, I wish we didn't even have to go over the HTML and the CSS. We need more JavaScript. And then another guy came up and said, you know what? I am so happy that you we went over and hit the HTML and the CSS hard because what I do in my job, I use that every day. So I, as always, as you'd probably guess, there's no way to please everybody. All right. But as far as things they didn't like, now this is the this group graduated anywhere between 2020 and 2022. So we have changed since then we have changed the uh, AWD program. So in the fourth semester, you have a C sharp class where you write web apps using C sharp. And that's what a lot of them said is they wish they would have had a class like that because in the AWD 1100 class, that Grant took last semester, and some of you will take this summer, people were saying we didn't get enough database. Well, now what you're going to find is that last class you take during the last semester here at Rankin, AWD 1115, Database Driven Website Development 2, is C Sharp Web Apps, and almost from about week three or week four, everyone that you do after that has got a database in it. So it sounded like we were doing a lot of stuff right. Then it was interesting because Mr. Corrigan said, well, what do you think of the gen ed classes? And there were a couple people who spoke positively, but there were, literally were about 15 students. And I'd say to a person, almost every one of them said that the majority of them were a waste of time. And it was interesting because Mr. Corrigan was there and he was taking copious notes, as they say. But a lot of people complained and said, they have no no real relationship with the instructor. Some of the tests, they weren't sure how they did. They didn't get a lot of feedback, et cetera. So the only reason I'm bringing this up is if you're not aware of this, at the end of each semester, so at the end of this semester, four weeks from Friday, you are going to get probably one or more online evaluations. You'll be asked to evaluate this class the one you're in with me right now, and any general education classes you're taking. And now for the one you evaluate this class on, it's it's pretty much three parts, all right? So you, you basically evaluate, did this class do what they said it was going to do? Number one. Number two, was the book or were the books helpful or should they re be replaced? Number three, did the instructor have a clue? type of an idea. And all I've ever asked, I don't see these. What I get is a summary of these evaluations. Never has a name on them. They're, when you send them back in, they don't at all ever set it up. They're all saved into an anonymous pot, so to speak, and nobody ever knows who said what. But all I've ever asked is, please, when you do that, be honest. You want to bash me, this is your chance. You want to bash the book or the books, this is the chance. You've got you've got some what you consider to be constructive criticisms of me or the class of the book, put those down, but just be honest. All right, so that's that. Now, with where we are in here 
right now. There we go. So we have now, after tomorrow, we'll have gone through everything that you see highlighted on the screen. All right, we did chapters one, two, and three, and then we had a relatively simple test. The average on that test was about a 94 or a 95. All right, then we did four and five, and we got into a little bit harder stuff because we talked about arrow functions, function expressions, event handlers, et cetera, and we had another test. Then we went in and just did six and seven, where we talked about the DOM and working with images and timers. All right, now we're, with where we are right now, next week you'll have a test. The test won't have very much in here with animations, but it probably will have a little bit. And think about where I might put in animations. For instance, if you're saying who won, maybe we want that to, to fade in on the bottom of the screen with either a picture of a rock, a picture of a paper, picture of a scissor, or whatever. But it'll be something probably along those lines. All right. With the forms, you will be asked to revalidate that form but re revalidate that form using jQuery, all right? And I don't want you to sit there and just put in HTML5 validation by putting required into all those fields. No, that's not what we're going to be looking for. And I haven't written the test yet, so I have no idea if there'll be anything in there with plugins or not, all right? Okay, so that'll be next week. And then when you come back the following week, Notice what we have in here. Chapters 12 through 19 are left. And I will tell you what my hope is, is over two weeks, two weeks, we'll cover 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. We'll cover those five chapters. All right. Are you going to have a test? I'm going to ask Evan if he gave a test on there. If he did not, I won't. But you will still be responsible for labs, homework, and written tests. For chapters 17, 18, and 19, the second last week of class, the second last week, I'm going to go over all of those. You will not be responsible for anything. I'm not going to give you any written tests on those. I'm not going to give you any homework or labs on those. I will not give you any hands-on test on those. But after we go through chapter 19, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to rewrite the BMI app and we're going to rewrite it as what's called a React app, just so you have some experience doing that, all right? The last day of class literally is four weeks from Friday. It's May 5th. I wanna give you at least the third and the fourth, those two days where I'm not, where no, no lecture, no nothing. That's where you can catch back up. I would like everything turned in by midnight, if not earlier, on that Thursday, not on Friday, but on Thursday. And the reason for that is I've got to have grades in Friday morning, and I need time, plus some of the projects my afternoon classes class is doing, they're going to be more extensive, and I'm telling them the same thing I'm telling you. So that's what we've got left for the rest of the semester. Finally, before we get started, and we are going to get started in just a moment here with chapter 10, but I just wanted to show you, all right, because sometimes people ask, yes, I have done the homework and all of them myself as well. So I don't think we need to spend more than literally about a minute on this, but on that first test that you had, there are different ways of doing this. This was my first one. I created an array, if you remember that, with movies, and then you asked them to add another movie. All right, and that's basically all we did. And then I added the new movie. There are other ways to add the new movie other than the way I've shown here, all right? But we haven't gone over those ways yet because they're in the arrays chapter. So this is probably the easiest way of adding a new movie. So that's what I did. So notice it should come in when we print this and it should say Field of Dreams, hit the enter key, Rocky hit the enter key, Dirty Harry hit the enter key, and then whatever movie we add. So again, if I come in here then, all right, and I don't know, The Shining. 
Real New Dreams, Rocky, Dirty Harry, and The Shining. So you can see that. That's what I was looking for with the first one. With the second one, and again, these were not meant to be that difficult. This was the one where you got this, and I put in all this stuff, legal age, etc., put in all that, and I ran it so you could run it again and again. But again, notice, please enter your age. If it's not a number, I gave you a, an alert, and the alert said, please enter your age. All right, and that was all it would do. Okay, um, otherwise, if you were out of range, it said age out of range. Otherwise, if you were less than the legal age, it says you're not old enough. Otherwise, it says welcome to the venue. Then I offered the opportunity to do it again. I don't think you were asked to put this code in. So if you didn't, it was totally fine. All right, then the third one. That was the one, two, or three. One is the loneliest number thing. So again, I set up constants for one, two, and three. All right. So again, we came in here, asked you to put something in. It was a one. It said one is the loneliest number. Two, two can be as bad as one, et cetera. And three, whatever it said for three, there is no three. Other than that, it just came up and said, you did not enter a valid number. So I did it like that. And again, gave you the chance to run the program another time. Finally, the last two, which were probably the easiest in the assign or in the, on the test. All right, that's the whole thing. There's people did it in different ways. I did it once with a for loop and I went back and redid it with a while loop. Either way would have worked just fine, but you were supposed to print all of the odd numbers between 1 and 100. And as you can see, that's what this does. All right, then finally, we had this one, which printed like every 15 numbers or whatever. All right, and that was that. So these last two were literally only a handful of lines. All right. And when we ran this, it was the same way. All right. And like I said, several people got 100% on that particular example. And I, I'm not trying to speak on a turn here, but at least in my humble opinion, all right, that was not that hard of a test. Now, you may disagree with that and say, no, it was pretty hard. Well, then hopefully you, you know, it, you found it easy compared to the other ones. All right. And I just want to show you again, because I'm trying to show you, I'm doing the tests as well. So this was test number two. So this was the first time we had to come in there and do the game. Now, you may or may not be aware of this. You may or may not care. These are buttons. You can make buttons that have images on them. So this was my home page. There's my about page. There's my game page. So if I say new game, scissors, notice tie game, new game, paper, all right, new game, rock. So you can see played three times and I've got three different wins, so to speak. And then we have the full, the um, form. And this one was just supposed, you were supposed to fill it up with, uh, oh, I don't know why I don't have it in there, but it's supposed to just fill it up with uh, alerts. All right. And then we were asked to go back and redo that one. So it can look the same. All right. But now in here, all right, that if I say new game and I do this, I just put it in like this. I was lazy, I guess. So the user one, if I clear it, it's automatically clearing. I do a new game. And you can see how that's going. Some people used a picture in here. Eat whatever you used was fine, as long as you did what you were asked to do. And then on the form, and for some reason, this was working fine earlier, but if I put nothing in here, that was printing out into a regular box in here. I don't know. I've done something wrong there. I don't really care what it is. And reset works. All right. So again, the reason I'm telling you this 
is when you take the test next week, it's going to just be an extension of this one. So you're going to basically be asked to implement jQuery features and functionality into features and functionality into your rock, paper, scissors application. And in the same way, and I'm not going to bring these up, but these are the pretests, and I've done those as well. So the last pretest that we did was this. All right, the BMI and the guessing game, etc. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to re-implement some of this stuff and or I'm going to add a form in here. All right, and show you how to do that next week. All right, with jQuery. So that's pretty much where we stand. So with all that said, then let me jump into. Sorry, that was like a 20 minute interlude, but I'm going to jump right into um, chapter 10. All right, so chapter 10 is how to work with forms and data validation. The first part of the chapter, pages 3 to 330, we'll literally spend about five minutes on because it's all review. Telling how forms work, talking about HTML5 controls for forms, and talking about HTML5 and CSS3 features for form validation. So, and you already know this, there is a certain amount that you can do as far as form validation without writing any JavaScript. All right, that's not what we're looking to do here. Rather, as it says, we'll look in these four or five pages to talk about the different things in jQuery you can use to work with forms. And then finally, we'll go through this validation application. So I'm going a little out of order. We're going to go over chapter 10 right now. We should be able to finish this hopefully around the time of our break. All right. Then after that, we'll go through those couple problems for chapter nine. And we'll see where we are for time. If we have time, we'll do the chapter 10 one as well. Otherwise, we'll do it tomorrow. All right. Now, there is in my opinion, for whatever my opinion is or is not worth. All right, there is some really good information in here. And of course, this is locked up. All right. And what I mean is they do a nice job in here of explaining everything that happens when you are working with a form, such as <clears throat> when you have a get that you're using, all right? So if your method is get, then everything that you put into the form is saved and displayed in the query string right up here in the address bar. So you don't want to use get when you are working with anything that's asking for personal information, passwords, credit card numbers, et cetera. For there, you want to use a post. So the post, what it does, as it says, is basically that form data is included in the HTTP request. And technically, it's included in what's called the HTTP header. So it's not visible in the browser. And as it says right there, it makes form submission using a post more secure than a get. But if you if you put something in thing in with a post bookmark it. So there's pluses and minuses to both of these. All right. For the first time in here, you're going to see something probably either today or tomorrow that's going to be a little different. And what I mean is when we go and fill out our HTML form, and if it succeeds, in other words, if every form validation thing that's in there passes, all right, we're not going to be calling a server side function like you will do next semester, or like you will do in the AWD 1115 class, but we will be calling another HTML file which will display everything that we've entered. All right, so you see that. 
Finally, when you click the submit button, the idea is the form, all of the form values are restored to their default values. All right. Finally, they mention in here that when you send information from a client to a server, so in other words, when you fill out a form and then click a submit button, ideally, you're going to do some data validation on that, not just what we've been doing thus far, basically, which has been saying that a field is required. We've done a little bit more than that. We've set the type equal to email. All right. Equal to number, et cetera. So we've done a little bit, but there's more that you can do in true data validation. And we're going to start looking at that in more depth and breadth of coverage here. And I've mentioned this to you before, but it says on the bottom paragraph there, usually the browser validates data before it gets submitted to the server. However, even when it gets sent, sent to the server, it is revalidated always. And that is for two different reasons. Number one, it is totally possible that the person can disable JavaScript on their machine which means that no data validation is basically, or let's say limited data validation will be done on the client. And the other thing is almost always form data is going to be put into a database. You wanna validate it because the worst thing in the world really that a company can have happen to it is that it's data database data gets corrupted. All right, so that's what they talk about to start with, okay? And again, you should be able to look at everything that's in here. This is a very, very simplistic form they're showing. Even the stuff that's in here, that's in mustard, what's new? Well, this says that when you click this join our list, which is our submit button, we want it to go and take that data, send it over to a file on the server called join.php and work with it that way. Also, the method that we're using is get, which means as they show right here, when the form is submitted, that's what you're actually going to end up seeing. That's what you're going to end up seeing in the um, query. Well, the query string is what comes after the question mark, but that's what'll be up in your address bar. All right, so that's pretty much it. And when you look here, notice it's judy at muroc.com. The at sign isn't shown as an at sign here. It's shown basically as its equivalent. I think that's its ASCII equivalent, but I'm not even sure. All right. So it says we have in here what? The email address is judy at muroc.com. The first name is Judy. All right. The name, the action, and the method that are in here by now, those should make sense to everybody. We had a whole chapter back in, I think it was chapter 13 in the HTML portion of the class where we went over forms and we built several forms. So as far as HTML controls for working with forms, here's some of them. We've worked with some of them. We have not worked with all of these. All right, again, I mentioned email before. All right, if you say type equal email, the what will happen is, you know, when, when you go to send something, validation will automatically be done to make sure there's an at sign, something before the at sign, something after the at sign, including a period and then something else. All right, so it'll do that minimal validation for you. If you set the control type up to URL, then it is expecting that you're going to start this with either, with either HTTP colon slash slash www dot or HTTPS colon slash slash www dot. And if you don't put all that in, it won't. One is interesting is designed to do all right is to hold a telephone number all right that is one that has got limited limited um 
browser support. And what I mean is, when you go and you set it up for Tell, it's ideally what that's going to magically do is if you're running this from your phone, you've all seen this kind of thing, the, that basically it'll show you a number and then it'll show you an option underneath it. You can either click the option underneath it or click the number and it'll call for you. All right. That works in a browser typically. It doesn't make a lot of sense on a laptop typically. All right. The number, we've talked about some of the foibles so to speak, of using a number, and what do I mean there? Well, you can set a min and a max, all right? You can set a step so that each time, you know, that's going to come up with that spinner, that up-down control. So if I put in there, like, let's say I'm doing salary, and I want it to the, I want it to step by 1,000, and I want the minimum to be 25,000 and the maximum to be 100,000. Then 25,000 will appear when I start, if I click the again, it'll go to 26,000, et cetera. That said, the number is only somewhat, where, it, where it's somewhat supported. And that is, that is that you can still manually key in a number that's out of range. It, it should catch it in the code that you put in, but you can do it. Plus notice what it says, when supported, different browsers give different amounts of support to this stuff. That's why, you know, if, if you desire to have a, co a career as a web developer, you want to make sure that as you're creating different applications, you run those applications in as many browsers as you can, all right, and in as many versions of browsers as you can. You may or may not remember this, but one of the things I mentioned a while back was this thing that I had found online that's called the the uh, I think it's Bliss Bliss browser. All right, I don't know where it download Bliss browser. And what that is, what's nice about Bliss is that it allows you to you know to to basically do the equivalent of showing what it'll look like on any kind of browser. All right, and any kind of device. I mean, we've done things where you've come in here and we've clicked up in here. You know, when you brought a web page up and you can simulate what it'll look like on an iPhone or whatever, but you don't really know what it'll look like on there until you actually run it on one of those devices. All right. The range, as it says, notice again, when supported. All right. So the next, all the next three or four say when supported. How can you find out? about more about support, you can go again to that caniuse.com, all right? The date usually will bring up a date picker, which is, they call it that pop-up calendar, but on some browsers, it'll just bring up a text box with arrows on it, especially older versions of browsers. And time, again, allows you to come in and set up mix, min, min and max, et cetera, all right? Autofocus, we've normally come in and set an autofocus on whatever our first form element is so that when the program begins running, that means that right away it will be showing right there. All right. And that's typically, again, what we're going to be, we're, well, the cursor will be on that field. That's typically what we want. Placeholder, they have an example right there showing you and that's a good example because anytime anytime you know there's there's any discrepancy over how a person is supposed to input something you can use a placeholder you know they sometimes you'll even see in front of that like there they've got 999-999-9999 sometimes they'll put before that e dot g dot for example or whatever again to a person you just want to make sure that when they fill it out they know what they're doing so it doesn't get sent back to them and again you'll notice in here we've got an email address a name and a phone number the email address is of type email the phone number is of type tell and the name is just of type text all right so it says here many of these provide basic data validation you can also use the attributes in what they're going to show next in here all right, so there's some more stuff in here. Now, 
when we look at this, some of the stuff that's in here we are going to actually talk about in a later chapter. I believe it's chapter 13 that's going to really talk about this pattern, the third one down that you see, because most of that chapter is concerned with what's called regular expressions, but they're just introducing it here. You already know what the required attribute is. The title is one that sometimes I think I should be using more. Notice what it says. It displays a tooltip when the mouse hovers over the field. Plus, the text that you put in for the title is what's displayed with the default error message. So if you don't like that this field is required, etc., you can put a title in there. And they show that in the example that we'll look at momentarily. All right. Pattern again is with regular expressions. You may or may not remember. All right. But one thing that we talked about was that HTML5 pattern dot com that we looked at a while back. And as I said, it's a good starting point. So if you want to know how to set up a phone number, all right, in the United States, if you want to know how to set up dates, etc., it isn't perfect, but it's a good starting point for you to look at to be able to understand regular expressions. The no validate, all right, as it says, it's a Boolean. You know what that is. It's a true false. So if something is set to no validate, what you're doing is you're telling the system, all right, you're telling the system they shouldn't validate that form or that control. It's not used often. Some places I've seen even call this a decorator because you're putting that in there to decorate a field to tell to give it specific instructions. And in this case, the specific instructions are don't validate this field. The autocomplete is on by default. This is something that typically while you're testing, you want turned on. And after you're done testing, you typically want to turn it off. All right. And what that does, if you've ever brought up a form before and looked at it and you start, you, you know, you go into the, where your first name is and you type in there and you see it gives you a bunch like a drop down list of stuff that's in there. All right. You can so you use that to auto complete things. So with the form, they come back here then, same form they've been working with, and notice that each field is required, that auto complete is set to off, all right, and that there is a pattern for the phone number. And notice they put a title in. Put in an e illegal phone number you click the join our, our list, you get that message. Must be 9999, et cetera, right there. All right. Finally, they say here, two of the reasons why you need JavaScript for data validation. All right. Number one, the HTML input controls and attributes for data validation may not be implemented the same way by all browsers. All right. Number two, HTML5 is limited by the types of validations that it can do. For example, it cannot check whether one field is equal to another field. That isn't exactly true, but basically it is. So for example, if you've got a field that's called password and underneath it, you put another field called confirm password and you want to make sure those are the same, you know, really, you're going to have to check that with JavaScript. All right. OK, so now we jump into it, the last 10 pages of the chapter. And as it says here, this is how to use jQuery to work with forms. Now notice here, jQuery doesn't provide specific features for data validation. All right, the good news is it works with the stuff that we've already looked at for validation. So when you look at these, Wow, what's new? Well, there's a colon before all these things. All right. So again, those are the selectors. We looked at val, and you remember when it's val like this, all right, whether it's a getter or whether it's a setter. 
All right, we talked about this. We looked at examples of it yesterday. The trim function, hopefully you remember that. We've looked at that before. So if I come in there and I've got a field like this, for some reason, I have a bunch of blank spaces and I type in hello out there and a bunch more blank spaces and I call trim, trim will remove leading spaces and trailing spaces. It will not remove spaces that are within the field itself. And I think I probably have even mentioned this to you, but back in the day when people first started creating forms, the problem with forms is there wasn't a lot of checking in there for trim. So when people didn't feel like filling out certain fields, they just hit the space bar. And when when the, when their code was checking for things, this is before trim was actually implemented, it would just say, is there something in there? It wouldn't check and say, hey, is that something a blank? It would just check to see if there was something in there. All right. So as they mentioned right here, Again, the first table summarizes those selectors. The second table summarizes val. So we've worked with val already. The third is the trim method that I just mentioned to you. All right. As it says, there's examples in here of how to trim entries. All right. Then it says it shows how to get the value of a checked radio button in a group. All right. So where's that? Well, you should know that already. You're doing colon checked. Now, when we did that in vanilla JavaScript, we'd be saying, saying the name of the field dot checked. So the, the syntax for this is a little bit different. All right. So this is going to look into an input with that name. And if it's checked, it's going to grab the value and it's going to assign it to radio button all right and if it is checked it'll be assigning true and if it's false it'll be assigning false all right if it's not on or whatever you want to call it now when you work as it says here with options notice what they have in here they're setting up an array to show you all the options that are in a list all right and then you can again as it says say select list colon selected that this is really implying here that it's possible to have not just one, but multiple things selected. Now, all of that is summarized in here. I'm sure much better than I just did. All right. But I'm not when, when we do this, you've already seen. You've already seen on the um, what did we have? We had eight pieces of information right on our form. We had first name last name, address, city, state, zip code, uh, email, and phone number. Am I going to ask you to put in another field that has in a radio button or a checkbox? Possibly. All right. I don't know. I haven't written it yet. I'll probably write it Monday while you guys are going over the, uh, while you guys are going over the pretest. All right. So as it says here, jQuery provides special selectors for selecting the controls on a form, the val method for getting and setting, and the trim for trimming an entry. All right. Now, next, they're showing some of the methods that you can use with this. And again, we'll go back in a minute. Some of these we have talked about already. All right. And some of these we really haven't. We've talked about focus already. So if you take your mouse and you click on a certain field, you are basically initiating a focus event on that field. If you take your mouse after you put something in that field and click on another field, two things are happening. A blur event from the first field and a focus for the second field. And that's what they're talking about in here. All right. The, as it says, the handler runs when the value in the selected element is changed. So a lot of times when you're looking at change, it's not going to be a text box necessarily. All right. Select, as it says, when the user selects text in a text or a text area box 
and submit when you click the submit button. All right. So what we're really, really doing in here, and I think you all realize this, but what we're really, really doing in here is we are providing interactivity into our form and we're letting the user know if you did something incorrectly, we're letting you know. So when you when you click that submit button, we don't want your form to be submitted to wherever it's going to unless every field that's in there has been validated so that it's holding the type of information, all right, that it's told to hold, all right? And as they say in here, it says, for instance, the handler for the focus event runs when the focus moves to the selected element. The handler for the change event runs when the value, the value, excuse me, of a selected element is changed. All right, so they run through these. Then there's again are some examples in here. So let's look at this. Notice this is the change event for a, a check or a, a, I guess it's a checkbox. All right, one of the examples we're going to see in the homework part for chapter 10. All right, or maybe it's even the one that's at the end of the chapter. I don't remember, but they have it set up with a couple different radio buttons. Are you an individual account or are you a corporate account? And different things are going to be made available to you depending upon which one of those radio button options you choose. All right, okay. Notice in here too, it says a handler that triggers the submit event. This is important. What they're saying here is this is not a submit button. All right. If you want to treat something like it's a submit button, notice there's a submit event. And technically, that's what fires when you click a submit button by default. All right. And that's pretty much what they're saying in here. Now, the last bullet says, you can use an event handler for the submit event of a form to validate data before it's sent to the server. Any data is invalid, you can issue that prevent default method that we've talked about, and that will cancel the submission of it going to the server. All right. All right, so the most of the rest of the chapter here then is going to discuss this validation application. So let's first look at it. You can tell by looking at it here that first of all, let's see, we've got everything is got it's inside of a border. Fine. We've got three. All right. Basically, it's broken down into three different field sets. Each field set has its own legend. The legends have been made blue. And they've been made blue with CSS. We don't care. All right. And you'll notice the first three. This should be type email, and if we put nothing in there, it'll say this field is required. If we put a non-email value in there, it'll say must be a valid email address. The password is set up that it's got a minimum of six characters. All right, so if you put in less, you get that message. If you leave it blank, all right, you'll get a message that says must be six or more characters. The verify, if you leave it blank, you as it shows there, you get this text is required. If you put something in there, it must match what's in there. Those should all make sense. Now, looking in this one, membership is individual, so the company name is blanked out. The first name is in there, the last name is in there, and the phone number is in there. Corporate, this will not be blanked out. So again, what we're saying in here is this basically will be this will be set up based on what you chose here. All right, then there's a submit button and there's a reset button. When you start working with this stuff, all right, you'll notice that in here, okay, they've got form action equals register.html. So if everything works, it's going to bring up this file right here that'll show what you've entered. 
It's a get because there's really nothing in here. Well, actually, with a password, you probably would want to make that a post, but they made it a get. All right. They've got all the fields that are in here. You'll notice that they're going back to adding these spans. And they're not even showing everything in the code, so we can take a look at it. In fact, let's take a look at it after the break. All right. But as it says in here, parts two and three represent most of the JavaScript in jQuery. All right. They've put in there. So when we look right here, what do we have in here? Well, the only thing that we really have right here in the HTML, there's we've got placeholders in here. And we've got an ID for the form. And then when we come over to here, this is not all of the code. All right. So there is the HTML, and as it says, first and last name fields are omitted here for spatial reasons. I asked once, because I know some of the people who work at Muroc, why they do this. And they said it's the difference between having a book typically 100 pages, as opposed to having 1,000 and 1,100 pages, if they always put all the code in for each example. All right. So you'll notice again, there's a placeholder here for the phone. All right. And again, the type is equal to submit. So in other words, right there, okay, we have, we've got a button of type submit. So when we look into our JavaScript, the only thing they're putting in here is the stuff for the radio button. And what they're saying in here, all right, is that if radio button basically again we'll run this after the break but you want to check and see so that if corporate if again if corporate is selected here that it allows you to enter a company name and if it's not selected you can't put in a company name all right that's all the code they're showing there and it's explained here all right, probably better than I just did, but it's explained right there. All right, they give you some more of it here. So most of it in this case is here. So when we come in here and we look at the email, notice they've done a trim on there. Actually, they're doing a trim on virtually every field that's in here. I always think that's a good idea. All right. And then they've got their password and their verify password and that's where they're coming in and they're checking to make sure that the two are the same all right if is valid is false meaning that one or more of these checks have failed you do an event dot prevent default which means you don't let the submission go through and that is it for the chapter so let's do this all right so what we will do let's see This is the same program right here that we just were looking at for the last few pages. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm not going to worry about making a CSS folder, et cetera, but I want to bring up the register file and I want to bring up the member file. All right. I'm going to bring those up in here, but just so you see this, because I mentioned it before, if I come in here, oops, not that one. I'm sorry. If I come in here and well, that's actually what's going to happen in here is if everything works, it's just going to come up with this message in the example that we'll go through at the end of the chapter, the assigned example. All right. It's going to bring up a whole other page that's going to have all the values that you put in it. All right. It is nine o'clock. Let's take a break. Let's come back at 910. And once we do, we're going to take a look at these two files. I'll see you then.
All right, it is 910. So um, again, what I'd like to do is just take a couple minutes and go over this example. Then look at the two examples we talked about for chapter nine, and we'll see where we are. And if we can get the other one in by 10, fine, 10 or 1030. And if we can't, then we'll just do it tomorrow. Now, I do want to mention when you see this in here, this looks a little weird, possibly. You've got a script tag. And you've got an ending script tag. And what you see in here is this, which looks kind of weird. All right. Back in older versions, of HTML when you use JavaScript and you tried to put it inside of HTML files, occasionally at least, what happened was, even though you put it in there and you might have put, put it in there and put script tags and whatever, that somehow it was degraded. And what I mean is the system still looked at it as it tried to make it into HTML, all right? Putting something like this at the beginning And this basically saying, hey, this is JavaScript. Now, that wasn't a great explanation, but if you just look up, just Google C data, and I probably should have done that during the break. All right. But let's take a look at what's in here. Okay. And so they're coming in here. They've got this, this thing called decode. And what are they doing? All right. Well, this is really hard to, to sit there and look at and even understand what the heck is going on. All right. But it looks like they're coming in. This right here, that's the delimiter. All right. And they're replacing, it looks like at least, they're globally replacing any instance of a plus sign. The G means global. This is the beginning of the tag. This is the end of the tag. All right. Then this is turning off any special meaning. So it looks to me like they're saying replace any instance of a plus sign with a blank space. All right. Now that's the kind of thing that you have to take a look at in here. All right. When um <clears throat> what do I want to how do I want to word this? That <clears throat> The more complex your form is, all right, the harder it's going to be to validate it. Did they have to show all this stuff? I'm not even sure why this is in here, to be honest with you. All right. And they, maybe they explained it in the chapter and I just didn't notice it or whatever. All right. Now, I want to concentrate because you're not going to have to do anything like this. Write this inside of here but you should understand what's going on in here. So let's take a look. One thing I do like about what they're doing in here is if you notice, it's not filled with a boatload of comments, but there are some in here. All right, we've got our use strict. We've got our document dot ready and you'll notice it starts here. And where does it go to? The very end. So this is about 110 lines, probably around 100 if you take out all the blank lines. All right. By now, this should make sense. We are just literally saying, remember that what is in here, the email is the first, you know, that first text box. So we're saying put the cursor there when the program starts. Again, this is our handler for our radio button. So if we were writing this back in vanilla JavaScript that we did before that we started the uh, jQuery portion, we would had we would be adding an event listener here. All right. And what we're checking for. What we're checking for here is what? Is the radio button. That's the value that's literally grabbing the value that value, if you remember, or just in case you don't, I guess that value. or it's going to be corporate to be one or the other. Also, if you look back in our HTML, all right, back in our HTML, where is it? Oh, this is the register one. That's why I'm, all right, let me bring up the other one. I want the index.html. There we go. All right, you'll notice that for the membership type, 
All right, it could be individual and that is set to checked. One thing that typically happens today when you write any form like this is if you write a form and you do have radio buttons, check one at the get go. Again, the one you're going to find in here most often is going to be gender. And although there's still, you know, there are today male, female, and other, it still is mostly prevalent, prevalent rather, with male and female. All right. And it doesn't really matter which one you check, but the point is by having one of these checked, you can be assured that one will always be checked. All right. And that's that's the big thing. That's the main reason for doing that. All right. So when we get in here then radio button all right will either hold corporate or it won't hold corporate okay all right so what does it say in here well if it holds corporate we no longer want to disable the company name field all right and we want to take that the text that's in there all right and it's going to be replaced basically with whatever we type. Otherwise, we do want to make sure that we're disabling that corporate field. So basically, this is just selecting what text box we're going to be allowed to type in. All right, so again, if I come in here, you've already seen it, but if I choose individual, notice I can't come in here and type anything. I can come in here, I can come in here and I can come in here. Not a problem. All right. And if I remove all that and choose this, now I can come in here and type in something. I still can put in a first name, a last name, and a number. Now, notice that this number right now doesn't have the dashes in it. So I get that error and the other ones because I didn't fill anything up here. All right. So as it says, here's the click, the handler for the click event of the submit button. All right. Now they do something in here that you don't find a, done a lot. That is they've set up an email pattern. All right. So what this is saying is this is the start of the email pattern. And this is the end of the email pattern. All right. And what this is saying is these we can the plus sign means we can have one or more lowercase letters uppercase letters numbers a period a percent sign a plus sign or a minus sign followed by an at sign and that at sign must be followed by one or more lowercase letters uppercase letters numbers periods or a minus all right, and then finally you'll have a period and then what comes after that should be just letters between two and four letters, uppercase or lowercase. Now, I wouldn't have put that in myself just because of the fact that today it, it the recommendation is that you don't even try to put in patterns for emails because some emails are just that hinky they're different than most of the other ones that we see the other thing i would have done in here that they didn't do is every place in here they've used the double equal sign i'd use the triple all right because again that's that's equality and identity all right so you'll notice we've got the email we're trimming it we're saying if it's empty the field is required and of course we set is valid to false all right then we're coming in there and we're running a test. This is a JavaScript function. We're running the JavaScript test function. All right. And what are we running it on? We're running it on the field called email. What is the test we're running? We're running the email pattern test. If it fails, then we should have the message must be a valid email address. And again, we want to set that equal to false. So if it was empty, or not a valid email, all right, either one of those are set to false. And this is going to set what was that asterisk in there to one of these two messages. If we get down to here, it was a valid email. In other words, it passed everything 
in this test up here. All we're doing before we go on is we are setting that red asterisk equal to nothing right there. That's it. All right. Then we're grabbing the value of our email. Then we do a similar thing, but the password is different in that, all right, the only thing that we put in there is that the length had to be less than six, all right, or if the length is less than six, we want to give them an error message. Now, this they made this real simple, all right, what do I mean? Well, I'm looking in here real quick. They do have a trim. So that's good. I mean, if you hit the space bar six times, that'll be removed. So it's good again that they have a trim in there. But this is where you oft times see when you go for something, they must be one or more uppercase characters, one or more lowercase characters, one or more numeric characters, one or more special characters. They could have gone a little nuts here and put that stuff in as well. So again, the only thing they're checking after they've trimmed it is if the length is less than six, they're going to come in here and change that red asterisk to must be six or more characters and set is valid to false. Even if it was already set before, it's being set again, won't hurt anything. All right. Otherwise, that's valid. And you're setting that equal to nothing and you're grabbing the value of that. All right. Then we're doing our verify entry in here. So this is where we're checking to make sure that the two are equal to one another. So it's interesting here they use the double equals, but here they use the equivalent of not equal with a triple equals. So they're not even consistent here. And again, I would just have done that. But they're just checking to make sure. So if you leave it blank, you get this field is required. Technically, technically, you don't even need this check. Because if they're not equal, you could just give them that message. So even if there was nothing in there, you could have just said must match first, first password entry. So there's always a lot of different ways of looking at this stuff is what I'm telling you. All right, then we're doing the company name. And again, notice we're saying here, if it's not disabled, all right, we're again doing a trim. And again, if we put nothing in there, then this field is required. Otherwise, what? We're making sure again, we remove the red asterisk and we're setting the company name. Then we're coming through and these should be pretty simple, hopefully by now, because with first name and last name, all we're doing is checking to see if it's empty or not. If it's empty, we are changing that red asterisk again from a red asterisk to this field is required. Otherwise, we're just allowing that to be done and we're setting the asterisk equal to nothing. So first name and last name are being done the same in here. Phone again, we've got a pattern. And again, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit. There's multiple ways of writing this, but the backslash D says three digits followed by a hyphen, followed again by three digits, followed by another hyphen, followed by four digits. That is the only acceptable format for this. And if you said, well, what about, you know, putting the area code in parentheses? You could do that, but that would extend the size of this. So what we're doing is we're forcing the user to set it up like this. Even this, all right, that this is not probably going to work with international phone numbers. All right, you can go back to that HTML5 pattern and check. All right. So finally, we come in, and if any of the checks failed, we do the prevent default. Now, I'm, my hope is, and we went through it quickly, I get that. All right. But that at least conceptually, everything that we did in there made some sense. All right. So let's go in. Go into here and let's take a look at the problems that we talked about doing in here. All right. So for chapter nine, 
The first one we're going to do is this image swap. Now, just so you know, to my knowledge at least, it already works. They want you to make it work differently. But I believe when we bring this one up, it already works. So let's take a quick look. So this is image swap. So when I run this and I do click, you can see what happens. And hopefully you can tell that both, both the slide that's in here and the heading, they both fade out and the new one fades in. All right, so these already work. So let's take a look at what's in here. All right, not very much HTML. And when you look, not very much. All right, so let's just, okay, I'm gonna bring this up. In fact, let's go bring it up in our editor of choice, which is code. And again, I'm not moving these over. I, I would normally do that, but I just wanted to go through these with you. So in here, what do we have? In fact, let's bring this up. Whoops, and then let's bring this up. Come on. And I'm gonna open this to this side. Bring it over here. There we go. All right. So close this and let's look first at the HTML. Now they've come in here and what have they done? Well, they've got an unordered list that has all five of the images in there. So that's building the thing up at the top. All right. And that should make sense. Notice we've got a title. We just talked about what the title means for that one. All right. So you've got a title for each one of those. All right. And also, I don't like this. I wouldn't have done it like this. I've always been told, in fact, um, I, I know of instructors when I've taken classes online and the like, they would mark off for this. And they'd say, hey, you are not accounting for somebody with a, with a visual impairment because they're not going to know what's there at all by that. All right, but that's just the way they did it. So we've got this unordered list of images. All right then this is what's down below so notice we've got the caption and it's just the first one all right and we've got the paragraph in there and the paragraph has got the image right in it so this says when we run this this first one the one that appears as the big image all right and then we've got our image swap so again you've already seen it in action so to speak <clears throat> So let's go in there and let's take a look at the code that's in there right now. All right. So we've got our use strict, nothing new in there. All right. And we've got our document ready. We're preloading. Now, this is interesting in here. All right. This is basically doing that each. So in essence, this is running a loop. So using the dot each in jQuery again is essentially running a loop. All right. So we're setting up five new images. All right. And we're also setting it up that they're all going to have some kind of a hypertext reference associated with them. OK, I'm wondering in here. I was looking, I, this may be the completed one. And if it is, I'm sorry, but we'll take a quick look anyway. All right, then if we click on any of these, and again, they've all been set up, so they're all basically hyperlinks. What are we doing? We're making that one active. We are setting the image URL for that one. We are setting the caption for that one. And then we are saying, what we want to have happen is we want to fade out what was in there and fade in what we want in there. So this is going to fade out what was in there originally. All right. So this will be. When we start, this will be the first image, so we're telling it to fade out over one second. All right, 
both the caption and the image. All right. Then when that gets done, we're telling to fade in again within one second, both, all right, both the caption and the image. All right. Now it says cancel or prevent default because there's nothing to have happen there. And then notice also how they've set this up. It's a little bit different. LI colon first child A. What does that mean? Well, let's just go back. We go back to here and we go back to the LIs. First child would be there and that's A. So we're basically saying in there, we want to set this thing up. So what has the focus when we first begin the program is that first thumbnail. All right. So again, when we run this now. You can see that right there, that is the same one. All right. That Well, actually, that's what. I guess that's that one right there, right? One, two. This is one, one. So this is the one that's highlighted. That's what we just did. If we click on there again over one second. You can see exactly. In there. For effect. All right. And unless I have you create something new for your test, it's not like, you know, again, we could have the the person who won the game or the image that won the game etc fade in or fade out yeah we can do that all right and i don't know we might have something in ours like on the bottom it may say like and the winner is and then have after we figure out who won have it fade in with that picture or something like that i don't know all right so that's the first one the second one that's in here I brought a couple of them in, so let's look. This is a personal timer. This is an interesting program, in my opinion, for whatever that's worth. So when I run this, it says total time. So let's say that I wanted to set up, I don't know, um, three hundred. It says in seconds, not milliseconds. And what do I want? How do I want it to show every? interval so how about every 10 seconds and i click start time then what should happen in here is after 10 seconds i should have a little mark here after 20 it should keep moving okay so it looks like right now maybe that's so it says 10 seconds 20 seconds we don't want that let's we want that we want this literally so when it runs, we want this to kind of look like a progress bar. So rather than showing us numerically how much has elapsed, when this gets to 150, I should have a little gray bar here that's halfway through. All right, I believe that's what they ask us to do in here. Oh, that's the other one that's back here. Let me go back. It's on the other one. So that's this one we just looked at. And then there's, where is it? We'll find it. Well, I don't know where it is. How's that? Let's just jump into this one. Fishing slideshow, all right? Debug a slideshow application. The slideshow is like the one in the book, but it has a bug in it. Instead of displaying the slides in sequence, it displays every other slide. Your task is to debug this application. All right. Five to 10 minutes if you can find the bug. All right. So that one is slideshow. You see already, I'm at a minute and 50 seconds here. All right, let me close a bunch of these. All right.
And it doesn't look like I brought that one up. So let's go find that one. There that is. Okay. So what we have. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. It looks like seven images. All right. And if they're in order, it should be going like this. So the guy fishing, another guy fishing, back to the first guy fishing, two guys, etc. So you can see how it's set up. Let's see if we run it right now, if it is going in that order or not. Okay, you can see that some are being skipped in here. All right. So it's not really running in the right order, in other words. So let's take a look at that and see if we can fix that. All right, so let me bring this up again. I'm going to close this one that we just had up. And we will bring up the slideshow in code. All right. And here's our index.html. And here is our slideshow. All right. So the index.html, let's start with that. <clears throat> Very similar to the one we just looked at. Here they were nice enough to put alt tags in here, but they've got an ID, a div with an ID of slides. All right. And oftentimes you see this kind of thing done where notice ID is slide, ID is slides. All right. So when we're working with just one slide, we singular it. And when we're working with all of them together, we pluralize it. Again, not that it's mandatory at all that you do that. No, but it's something that's quite often done. So let's take a look in here. All right. So we've got what? A document dot ready. OK, then we create an array of slide images. Now notice this is just a name. There's nothing special about coming in there and saying uh, image cache. There's absolutely nothing special about doing that. OK, but that's what they've named it. OK, so it's an empty array. Then we're coming through there and we're going to be in here. What are we doing? Well, we're iterating through all of the slides. All right, and we are associating with these slides. We're basically throw, going to throw them into that image cache array, and we've got each image in there, the source, and the alt. So they're all in there right now, okay? And then we're told to come in here and set up this slideshow that we have in here, all right? And what is it? So setting the interval, all right? So every three seconds, what are we telling it we want to have happen? We want the current caption to fade out over a minute, the, or a second rather, the current slide to fade out over a second. Once that is done, we want this to run, all right? Now, when they've got that image counter, trying to set, up, set it up so that the image counter will always be the next image, but when you get to the end, the idea is it should start back up again at the beginning. Now, hopefully what I just said made sense. All right, it's a loop around type of thing. 
OK, and then what we're doing here with the slide in the caption. All right, this is the newest slide in the ca in caption. So we're saying after you remove the old ones, bring in the new ones and do it at the same speed for lack of better words. All right. So again, when we look up here, and this may already be working, I don't remember. OK, so let's just take a quick look. I already did this, but I want to do it again. And that is. All right. So we are missing one in here. So my guess is what is happening in here is, and I didn't do this one, I'm just realizing it right now. So let's see if we can figure out together what the problem is. Whoops, not in there, we won't. All right, I believe that the error is in here. All right, and I'm not sure, so I'm gonna check. And the way that I'm gonna check is like this. Don't think this is going to hurt anything. And I'm going to put an alert in here that says image counter equals. And then I'm going to actually put in the image counter. All right, so I'm going to save this. And I'm going to try to come in and run this. Hopefully that'll work. Right, so it's one. Says it's two. Says it's three. Says it's four. All right, says it's zero. Says it's one. So according to this, it is working. It's looping around as you can see. Four. All right, so it's looping through all five. Let's see if it's actually working correctly or not. All right. Well, it's going to be a little. First thing I want to do is I want to stop this because I don't want these alerts to keep showing. All right, so we've got it running right here. You already know those numbers are correct. So I'm going to cut this down. like that, and then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to click on my images folder and I'm going to click on that one and I'm going to cut that down. All right, and then I want to map these up with one another. So there, there. All right, and you can see they're not the same. All right, so we are skipping some in here. Pretty obvious. All right. In fact, some of these, unless this one isn't with the rest, I guess, are not even showing. So, see if we can figure this out. All right. It is coming through here correctly, and it is figuring out the image counter, or at least it appears as though it is, but it looks like that the way that it's associated the images that are in here with the image counter are incorrect. So image equals image cache. I mean, it's it's hopefully at least it's pretty obvious what they're doing here. All right. But I think I think at least it could be that the what's happening here is it might just be that a couple of these lines should be flipped around. All right, so we've got our image. We've got our const, our slide and our caption. OK, so this is figuring out the next one. Now, what I want to see is if I take this, I'm going to comment this out for now. If I take this. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to copy it.
And then I'm going to put it down here. Because we're skipping one. So something is wrong in here. Okay, now this might not have fixed it. I don't know. But I'm going to stop the run. And then start it again. Now you'll know real fast because if it goes to the same picture, it's wrong. See, it did. So it went to the same picture. Now it's going to the next one. Okay. Now the good news is, I believe, believe it or not, I think it's working right now. There's just one thing we've got to change. What do I mean? We'll take a look at what it looks like now. Okay. And now I'm going to bring back up what I just had up here. And that is, I'm going to come and bring this up with the images like this. And cut that down like I just did, and then map these up. So it should be going, I'm gonna let this go back to the beginning and then we're gonna, okay, so let's see. There's one, whoops, no, don't talk about it. All right. Okay, so here's number one. Then there's number two. Then there's number three. No, it isn't right. It's still skipping. There's number four. All right. Well, what I'll have to do is go back. Go ahead. Yeah, I noticed I'm looking at my copy and on the uh, index.html that not all of the pictures are included in there, that original div. Gotcha. So I think I've got, I, I think what I've got in here is the answer. All right. And like I said, I did most of these last summer. So I'm, uh, and I apologize for that. But um, let me move that back. Get rid of that and get rid of this. All right. So I think this is actually, I'll, I'll go back and take a look at this for tomorrow and try to figure out what the heck the problem with that one was. The other one we had fixed already. But this one, I will go back and take a look at this and see if I can figure out what the darn problem is. All right, we will start with that tomorrow. Let's quickly, because it is 948, let's take a look at what they ask us to do for chapter 10. All right. So on this one, on these extra exercises, there is a chapter 10, use JavaScript to validate a form. On the other one, there is no chapter 10. So there is no extra exercise in there. All right. So the one that we're going to look at then will be this one. Now, I do want you to understand something that right now, this is a very simple form. What I mean is when we get to chapter 11, they're going to take this form and they're going to add some tabs in here. So in other words, this will become a three-part form as opposed to the way it is right now. But as of right now, it is at least a fairly simplistic form. So it says we will use JavaScript to validate a reservation request form. So application run to see what's displayed when the form is submitted to the server. Okay, fine. In the JavaScript file, note that the ready event handler contains the declaration for a constant named email pattern, which has that pattern for you. All right, then they want you to code a statement that sets the focus to the arrival date. Well, that isn't hard at all. That's just basically a focus statement. Then code an event handler for the submit event of the form. All right, this should validate. So what do we have to validate? Well, that can't be blank. That better be a date etc this it looks like must be numeric 
Now they've made it a text box where we could have made it uh, a number and we could have given it a minimum and a maximum, but they didn't. Adults looks like a drop down list with children, drop down list. Then we have two different groups of radio buttons, one for room type, one for bed type. And even though you don't find many hotels anymore, I don't think that allow smoking, we've got a checkbox for smoking. So that's in our preferences. And finally, then we've got the contact information. All right. Now, rather than just ball this up like I did before, what I think I'm going to do, this will be tomorrow. OK, so tomorrow when we start up, what we are going to do is I'm very quickly going to go over those two examples again from chapter nine. All right, and we should be. So we get done with that. Right in and do the example that's on the screen here for chapter 10. All right, after we get done with that, I'm going to lecture on chapter 11. Now I have mentioned this to you before, but I just want you to know that again, the chapter 11 is on the jQuery UI. It's on plugins, all right? And they talk about the jQuery UI, all right? I mentioned that yesterday in the lecture, but we will look at it in more depth and breadth of coverage tomorrow. And it's interesting because they talk about downloading the entire UI into your uh, application, which you can do. I'm going to show it more from picking out just the pieces we want and changing the code. So again, tomorrow we'll go over the two examples from chapter nine, then the one from chapter 10. Then I will lecture on chapter 11. All right, and we will look at one or two examples from chapter 11. So we are ending a little early today. We will probably run a little bit later than this then tomorrow. All right, and then again, remember there's no class Friday. And sometime, I, I if I have time, I mean, I'm going to try to write the, uh, I, I'd like to write the um, pretest by Thursday. So I can give you that then. All right, by the end of class tomorrow and show it to you what I'm expecting. And then Monday again, you'll have time to work on it. Wednesday, you will. Oh, what did we say? No, Monday, we said we'd make a lab. So Monday will be a lab day. Tuesday, I will give you time to work on the pretest. Wednesday, we will go over it. And Thursday, we will have the hands on test. Sorry, a little bit flaky this morning. This is just, I don't know. I'm not going to blame it on anything but me. So unless you have any questions, Grant, I will talk to you tomorrow at 8.05. Sounds good. See you then. All right. See you then.